Oh, good. Okay. Okay. It's all done. Yeah. Yeah. Glad you guys went over it. Yeah. It's a lot more complicated than the So then you got called with the call yeah. straightforward after. No. Yeah. So should, should we start? There's one person I haven't met yet. Good How are you? Jillian. Jillian. Okay. I mean, I, you're, probably just just next, you're probably just in line for next week. Yeah. We have a small group here, which I like. <laughs> I just had, because I'm on call this weekend. Aren't I? Oh, with you? Are, are you on call? I'm done with being on call. Yeah, yeah, I'm on call. <laughs> <laughs> Realize this conversation is being recorded. Yeah, so. <laughs> are, we, are we good to go? Yes. Yeah? Okay. okay. Well, I'm Nick Rogers, and actually I was sitting in your shoes not so many years ago. Well, more years than I'd like to admit. I was a resident of the program here on the faculty for about eight years and went to NIH, National Library of Medicine, where I was in their sort of R&D, small R&D arm doing informatics research. And the FDA for two years, Office of Orphan Kelly Development. Then back here. And... Uh, Glad to be back here, actually. You see, I have a real warm spot for the institution previous department. And I've had the chance to talk at least to Cyril here, and I hope to the rest of you before we're done, before you're done. Um, I, I brought enough material with me today for at least four or five lectures. Okay, so I should warn you up front. <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to dance over the top of the, the, the bullet points here. And a lot of them I'm just not even going to refer to. And I hope that doesn't disturb you. If it does, slow me down. If you see a point that interests you, do you want to talk about it? This is a free-form discussion, not a lecture. And uh, same for the folks at home. Send me an email if you get confused <laughs> or you have questions. There's my email address up on the screen. And uh, apparently it shows up on the go-to meeting as well, I'm told. Um, before we start, I usually ask a few questions. We've got a small group here. Usually they're a little more effective than a larger group. But I've already asked you, no one here seems to have a computer science background, although Tad, yeah. Tad, I'm sorry, Keyboard button. you've you've had uh, some programming exposure. Yes. Right. right. I was considering becoming a computer science major. Major at Berkeley. Okay. Yes. Well, and we'll be talking a bit more about Berkeley probably later on here. Um, who in the room has an iPhone? For all three? Okay. Who in the room uses a variant of the Unix operating system? No hands. Yeah, that was a dirty trick. I just played on you. Because <laughs> <laughs> exactly. This is a Unix computer, and it's a very powerful Unix computer. And we're going to be talking a bit about the role of Unix, actually, and some of the concepts relevant to Unix as we, as we go on. So it's good you fell right into the trap. <laughs> makes it a little more fun for me. <laughs> OK. Well, the, the topics that I hope to cover First of all, I, I should mention that really what I am, I'm, metaphorically speaking, I'm going to try to be some mortar for the bricks you've had in the other lectures. It's going to be dancing over a lot of different topics, and we can stop at any point you want. We can elaborate on other lectures, topics if, if you need to. Um, but these are the topics otherwise that I'd like to, to consider discussing. One is history, and you may think, well, why do I need to know that? Well, it's actually quite informative, plus it's fascinating. The history of computer science and biomedical computing is people with really amazing stories, fascinating stories. So it's good good for your general education, but I think it will also give you a little perspective on how computers came to be and what shaped their history and shaped the way they, they um, perform. We'll talk a bit about computers themselves, a bit about hardware and software topics, terms. We'll talk a bit about the Internet, its history, and, and how it's governed, what it is. Uh, give, talk more about the worldwide web as an exemplar of probably the, the ultimate um, internet application. We'll talk a bit about what I call the dark side, that is risk, safety issues, and regulation issues that are cropping up with medical software. And I should add, too, that I'm not going to be focused on lab medicine per se. I'm going to be talking in very general terms, but if you want to talk about specific lab medicine issues, please bring them up as we go along. Then what I'd really like to be talking about for two lectures on its own would be future directions, you know, cutting edge areas of research, exciting developments, where I think we're going to be heading with this technology in the next decade or two. So the goals, I said, are to sort of act as mortar to the bricks of the other presentations. We'll be reviewing key historical figures and events, skipping over a lot of what's in here, talking a lot about terminology, because it'll help you. When you're in the lab, you're going to be buying software. You're going to be dealing with programmers and database management people. The more you understand about the underlying technology, the better a manager you'll be able to be, the better consumer you'll be able to be when you're buying products and putting things in, in place. And again, 
we'll get back to what really grabs me, and that's discussing future trends. And, it, and I want to stress this really as a dialogue. Let's, let's make this a discussion. So interrupt me freely at any point with comments, observations, objections, questions, anything you like. So, well, you're going to see that I have a real fascination for the history of computers because about probably half the slide material is dedicated to that. And so we're going, to read, we're going to be marching through that very promptly here. I'm probably going to be trying to spend about 10 minutes on each of those major topics that I mentioned. But there's a quotation I'd like to begin with here. Uh, this is from a fellow named Albert Hetherington. He was quoting Howard Haken, who was a major founding figure in computer science. He built one of the first computers in this country at Harvard. Uh, and he was part of a major meeting. It was really a seminal meeting and then kicking off biomedical in this country. It happened in 1957. And uh, this was a very important meeting. I'm not going to say anything more about it now, but you can read a little uh, biography I wrote about a man we will be talking about, Bob Ledley. And uh, a lot of what he did, a lot of careers were built on what happened at this meeting. Howard Aiken was at the meeting. And he, he said something that was paraphrased by this man, Heather, and really what we are talking about is not so much the application of computers to medicine, but the application of mathematics and mathematical logic to medicine. The people in the early history of this field were passionate about the idea of bringing the rigor of the physical sciences into biology and medicine. Now, you've been brought up in an era where a lot of that's been done, so you take it for granted. <laughs> but it wasn't the case when these guys were doing their work. Believe me, they had a very difficult um, road to hoe. And in fact, in the early days, uh, Claude, uh, um, James Shannon was an early director of NIH, actually went out in the early 60s and offered 10 medical schools we will give you a mainframe computer and five years of support because we want to see this sort of stuff in medical schools. All you have to do is teach uh, some computer science courses to your students. Can you guess how many schools took up the offer? Zero. <laughs> Would that happen today? <laughs> you made an offer like that? No, it's, it's, it's inconceivable. So it just gives you an idea that this was far from um, an accepted idea back in the late 50s, early 60s that computers had any role role whatsoever. It seems unfathomable now, but that's, that was the state of affairs. Well, let's wind back the clock. Uh, Babylonians. We think of the advocates as a Chinese in invention, and I'm sorry, it actually was the Babylonians about three millennia ago. And that was basically, they also called the counting thing, a simple device for addition and subtraction. And you find it in virtually every culture after that. Every culture on the planet had some version, of, even the Mayans. And some cultures used uh, knots on woven material instead of uh, beads on, on wires, and fascinating gadget. In the West, of course, we think of the Greeks as founding figures in mathematics. In fact, the word math mathema is Greek for subject of instruction. Uh, their mathematics was largely based on geometry. They were very obsessed with geometry. And, but they also introduced the important notion of generalized theories and proofs, as opposed to specific solutions, specific problem. They're generalizing things. Um, you had a number of very important figures in the ancient period, 7th to 4th century, and the Hellenistic period, that is post-Alexander the Great period, 4th to 1st century BC. And probably the, the most important, if you had to pick out one or two figures, would be Pythagoras, Euclid, of course, the father of geometry, and probably Archimedes. Now, there was an interesting gadget that was found in a shipwreck from the 1st century BC. It was discovered in 1901. And it was only the last 10 or 20 years people started looking at it again. But people at the time thought it was some kind of early mechanical clock. In fact, it was re after study, it was realized it was an analog astronomical computer. This thing is absolutely staggering. It's on display in, in Athens. There are working replicas of it, including one in the American Computer Museum. Does anyone know where the American Computer Museum is? Bozeman, Montana. So if you're, in, if you're in Bozeman, Montana, stop there. There's a working replica, a reconstruction of this actually in the museum. There are two or three of them spotted around the world. That's the closest one. So you see this is kind of a rusted hulk. But the, uh, this quotation from the guy that actually has been working on this guy from the University of Cardiff, he considers the device extraordinary. It's the only thing of its kind. The mechanics just makes your draw, jaw drop. He considers it culturally more valuable than the Mona Lisa. This really is an amazing device. So it gives you an idea that people have been doing computing for a long time. The Chinese, again, remarkable achievements. They seem to have independently discovered most of the concepts of mathematics, very little or no contact with the West, um, including things like the decimal and binary systems, algebra, major points of algebra, geometry, trigonometry. Uh, they probably also discovered the Pythagorean theorem 
and, and something called Pascal's Triangle, which I'll show you in just a moment on their own. Um, and there was a very famous book called The Nine Chapters of the Mathematical Art that came out um, 200, 300 BC. Um, however, after the fall of the Yuan Dynasty, the 14th century, they basically turned their back on that until the 19th century. Just, okay, well, we've done that. Uh, they went on to <laughs> interest in botany, pharmacology, other areas of science, but mathematics just kind of evaporated. Sad. In the West, of course, it also kind of went into hibernation during the Dark Ages. What kept it alive was the Islamic world. And um, the period of the Caliphates, 622 to 1600, very important mathematical work was done. Most of this is still unstudied, sitting in scrolls and books and libraries. Uh, they extended the work of the classic Greeks. Uh, they discovered the, the idea of the decimal place system, including fractions. The word algebra, of course, comes from an Arabic word, algebra, reunion of broken parts. That was based on earlier Greek or Indian work, probably. They did a lot of work in geometry. Now, we think of Arabic numerals, too, right, the numeral systems we use. It's actually a misnomer, because, in fact, they were brought to us by the Arabs, but, in fact, invented by Indians much earlier. People don't realize that. Now, probably the single most important figure in uh, Islamic math was this fellow, Muhammad ibn Musa al-Khawarizmi. Uh, he was born in Persia, wrote a very important book in Baghdad but in the 9th, 9th century, or 7th century. And his name was Latinized and became the word algorithm. So Arab source for the word algorithm, which is a list of procedures, right, when you're doing a mathematical so you can have an algorithm for a laboratory chemical procedure, too. Right? It's basically a list of instructions. Um, one of my favorites, Blaise Pascal. You know, we're jumping quite a, far ahead now, back in the, up into the 17th century here. Um, he was born 29 years ago this week. There are two important celebrations this week. This is one of them. An amazing character. And it shows you that... Um, uh, there are contacts repeatedly between this area, mathematics and computing and medicine. This is one of them. He invented both the first mechanical calculator, the Pascaline, which I show you here on the screen, this beautiful little brass box. He did that when he started, started inventing this at 19, which finished at age 22. This guy was an amazing figure. Um, he also invented this wrench. So <laughs> there you go, a little, little early sort of kiss between computer science and, and, and medicine. <laughs> Uh, this is Pascal's triangle down in the right corner here. You see this triangle of, uh, of numbers, and you're adding the numbers in the, in the row above. 1 plus 1 is 2. 2 plus 1 is 3. 1 plus 3 is 4. 3 plus 3 is 6. This is Pascal's triangle. These, these are reproducing the, the um, constants that appear in, in binomial formulas. Uh, again, the Chinese independently discovered this later on. John Napier invented the idea of logarithms and something called Napier's Bones, which was a sort of abacus for doing mathematics, roughly a little earlier than Pascal, which allowed William Altred and others to invent the slide rule. And actually, we, we did this before you guys came to the room. Has anyone ever seen a slide rule? Okay. Well, now you've seen another one. This is one I, I've been unpacking boxes. This is an undergraduate relic of mine that I, I saw the other day, so I decided to bring along and show it to you today. Basically. Adding logarithms is the same as multiplying antilogarithms. That's the whole trick. So you can use this device for multiplication and division. A brilliant intellectual achievement, really. Yeah, I remember we were on an archaeology dig, and I uh -huh. dug one of these up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, I, I'm still getting the dust off my <laughs> shoulders. Charles Babbage, interesting figure. He invented a very serious mechanical computer. Um, he invented one called the difference engine number one. I'm not going to talk about that. Difference engine number two is kind of interesting. He never finished in his lifetime. He did complete designs for this thing. Two have been built finally in the last decade, funded by Nathan Mirable, a guy who used to be head of R&D at Microsoft. Also the father of this $500 cookbook. Have you seen that? He fancies himself a high-tech chef. <laughs> Anyway, he built one for himself, which is he's on loan at the Computer History Museum down in Mountain View, and um, he left one at the University uh, at the London Science Museum, where the original bit of the first difference engine is. They built this little part of it, a section of it. This is a picture of the device, which you can go down and see. I really urge you to run down and see this thing if you get an opportunity. Um, I'm just going to run this little video for just a second, so you can see it. Oh, 
strange. I was just at the London Science Museum. Oh, really? Did you see it? Yeah. Ah. What did you think of it? It's a large device, right? Yeah, it's a huge <laughs> device. I mean, I mean, and perform the carrying of tens. It was entirely mechanical. And watching this thing. It's continuing to swing upward. It is mesmerizing. Oh, I'm going to stop there because that's is exactly the word I would describe it. I mean, watching this thing, it was, it's hypnotic. The amazing thing is that this end here, right up uh, here, is a printer. I'm, sorry, I'm not making this up. It actually is a built-in mechanical printer, and it can print out answers to something like 31 decimal places. This was an absolutely staggering intellectual feat. And it's a great tragedy of his life, of course, that he was never able to actually see this working in his own lifetime. He went on to design, a, even though he failed at getting this built, he went on to design an even more advanced model called the analytical engine. And uh, he made a succession of designs for this machine. It was programmable via punch cards. Which is an idea. Exactly. <laughs> and this is the first computer that would have been so-called Turing complete. We'll talk about what this means in just a moment. There was a woman named Ada Lovelace, Lady Ada Lovelace. She may have been the first programmer. She worked with him designing an algorithm for computing something called Bernoulli numbers. Uh, and so she's often regarded honorifically as the, as the world's first programmer. There's actually a project afoot right now to build one of these. It's supposed to be operational by 2021. It would be equivalent to a machine today that had 675 bytes of memory and ran at 7 hertz. Okay. But still, remarkable, all mechanical. Herman Hollerith, okay, now we're jumping ahead to the 19th century. It's an American now. He was a statistician. He developed a tabulated, uh, a, a mechanical tabulator that used punch cards. Uh, in 1880, the census had taken eight years to compute. Eight years to computations. <laughs> So you didn't have the answers until, you know, 1882. The 1890 census took one year due to his invention. He was urged on by John Shaw Billings, who was probably the single most important director of the National Library of Medicine. He invented the Index Medicus, which is the forerunner of Medline, PubMed. I mean, he's, uh, people at MLM call him St. John. He's really probably the single most important historical figure in MLM history. In 1911, this, his company merged with three other firms, in 1924, it was renamed IBM under a man named Thomas Watson. And we'll hear that name Watson a bit later today, too. Anyway, here he is looking very proper, 19th century figure. Huh? And this is his tabulating machine to the right. Now we're jumping ahead to the 20th century to a man who's probably considered to be the father of computer science. And this is the other important um, date that I was mentioning to you. His centennial of his birth is tomorrow. This is a very propitious day to be talking about this field and about him. Uh, there was a tremendous celebration in this city last week in Association for Computing Machine, the ACM, who gives out an annual award called the Turing Prize, which is commonly considered to be sort of the Nobel Prize of computer science. They had a Turing Centennial here a week ago today. I was able to watch it from home. I didn't get my act together fast enough to get a ticket. It sold out like that. Because about half the living uh, Turing Prize winners were in that room. This is probably the most amazing assembly of, of talent that you'd find anywhere on the planet for that day and a half, uh, celebrating the life of this man. Uh, in 1936, uh, straight out of school, he wrote a, a, a really important paper in which he defined a hypothetical computing device that was called the Turing machine. And you can read more about that online on Wikipedia. Uh, it formalized the notion of what an algorithm was, and it really defined the limits of what was, quote, computable, end quote. It was a really an important paper. Uh, you could view this as the birth of modern computer science in many ways. World War II started shortly thereafter. He was uh, part of Bletchley Park. Have you seen dramas or know a bit about the history of Bletchley Park? It was the code-breaking center for, the, for Britain during the Second World War. It cracked the Enigma code that the Germans were using. Um, he played a really central role in that. Uh, and in fact, in 1942, he made an electromechanical device to help break the Enigma code called the bomb. So it was an early uh, computer, early electromechanical computer. He was secretly awarded the Order of the British Empire. It became public later, but at the time it was secret because his work was considered to be so classified, no one could know he had even done it. He went on then to the University of Manchester. In 1950, he wrote another really critically important paper, in which he outlined something called the Turing Test for Artificial Intelligence. He's considered the father of AI as well. The idea of the Turing Test, do you know what this is? 
you, you have like a test subject and they either have a conversation, they don't know who it is, but with a person or a computer and can they tell the difference? Right on. Exactly. Basically, I mean, suppose there's an entity in the next room. I don't know if there's a human or a machine and I have a keyboard chat with that person where I might, we might use verbal communication but using computer simulated speech in both ends so I don't know whether it's a person or not. And the question is after a certain amount of time, if you can't decide whether this is a human or a machine, you've encountered either a human or artificial intelligence. And it's still kind of the, considered to be the hallmark of AI today. In fact, there are annual contests, AI contests based on this criterion. He, at the end of his life, he worked on a really important area called bi biological morphogenesis. He predicted the behavior of these chemical oscillatory systems. But later on, were studied very heavily in the 60s, 70s, and 80s in this country. So he got interested in biology toward the end of his life. Tragic life, too. Uh, he was a homosexual at a time when homosexuality was illegal in Britain. He was prosecuted for homosexuality. Uh, he was given a choice. You can either go to prison or you can take female hormones. He selected the hormones. Terribly sad life. He committed suicide at 54 by cyanide. It's only in his 40s at this point. Um, 2009, there was a public apology from uh, Gordon Brown. They didn't exonerate him, though. As they said, they made the point that it was a, what he did was illegal at the time. At the time. So, uh, still on his record. 66, ACM created the String Award. If you... Uh, if you're interested in learning more about him, a good thing to do is to, to go up to this uh, uh, to the web. You can find this BBC film, Breaking the Code, with Derek Jacobi playing Alan Turing. Excellent movie. Uh, the Centennial event, you can also see this online. Uh, I'm looking at my time. I'm already way behind, so I'm not going to show you the five-minute video. That's <laughs> kicked it off, but I urge you, if you get time, go to the URL. There's a little five-minute video that sort of caps a summary of his life and achievements, and it's, it's a fun view. John von Neumann. Now, I think until we fully appreciated the contributions of, of Turing, in this country he would have been considered maybe the father of computing. Uh, he's still an important figure, don't misunderstand me. He was, in the words of uh, French mathematician Jean Dieudonnet, the last of the great mathematicians. This guy was a staggering intellect. Again, he died in his 50s with I don't know how many hundreds of papers. He, there was probably not a field in math that he didn't have some important pack, impact on. Today he's mainly remembered for game theory which is used a lot in decision theory, uh, in medicine, as well as in business. He designed the concept and, and design of the explosive lens for the first atomic bomb. This was an important part of the Manhattan Project, which drove his interest in computing. So it was really important for that project. He wrote an evaluation of an early electronic computer, the EDVAC, and it came to be dis uh, circulated in private by some colleagues of his, in which he described a conceptual machine. It came to be known as the von Neumann machine. And so many people sort of thought von Neumann machine was sort of the first, you know, design of a modern computer. Well, Turing probably gets the credit for that. Uh, his last work was on, he was writing it on his deathbed in the hospital. Published incomplete and posthumously, it was called The Computer in the Brain. So a lot of these people came around to fascination with, you know, biology, comparison between computers and human intelligence. Here's a picture of von Neumann. He was also quite a character. What I don't have time to share with you is amazing anecdotes about some of these people, really funny stories about Turing, about this guy. He was a real partier, apparently. Also fond of uh, reading books while he was driving, apparently the world's first driver. <laughs> they crossed paths briefly, although I, I don't know that they actually had any intellectual contact, but they were both at the Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton for a time, for a short time. Now we get into people who are important for biomedical computing. Lee, Lee B. Lusted. Now, if I had to ordain a saint in our field, this would be the man. And sadly, there's no Wikipedia entry for him. That's being remedied. Not by me. I wish I had the time for that. But by an historian in the field called uh, Joseph November. Uh, he had an absolutely seminal role. I talked about that earlier meeting. I had a quote from that was sort of critical. That set off a chain of events. And Lee Lusted turned out to be an important figure in that. He ended up being appointed by the National Research Council to head a lot of initiatives and a lot of meetings that ended up uh, designating where funding would go to support the birth of medical computing. And a delightful human being. I had a chance to meet him. He came and visited me here when I was just starting on the faculty here. He mentored and supported so many young people coming up the ladder. It was amazing. He founded the Society for Medical Decision Making and its superb journal, which I highly recommend to you, Medical Decision Making. i a lot of copy here. Now, he happened to work with another figure of importance, Bob Ledley, who's still alive, sadly suffering from Alzheimer's now, so he sort of stepped down from 
his intellectual life. He devised the first whole body CAT scanner. He was very heavily involved in the idea of scanning films of medical importance and doing pattern recognition on them. Uh, he devised early models for the what later became the protein data bank and gen bank. He had earlier versions of these things. Uh, he founded four different journals, including Computers in Biology and Medicine, of which I'm currently editor-in-chief, so I'll be stepping down the end of December. It's been crushing me. <laughs> uh, uh, he wrote an app, probably this key initial paper in Computing in Biology and Medicine with Lustig. It came out in Science in 1959, Reasoning Foundations of Medical Diagnosis. And again, I'm not going to push on the link and pull the paper up because I don't think we have enough time, but I highly recommend if you give it, if you have a chance to look at that paper. I'll send it to you if you're curious. Um, it introduced the notion of applying Bayes' theorem and ideas from control theory to medical diagnosis. And it had a huge impact. For example, it's sort of the second generation of people like Homer, Homer Warner at the University of Utah. Stanford off and devised a very elaborate, very sophisticated medical diagnosis system based on Bayes' rule uh, that was in use when I was a medical student at Utah. Uh, I, I would go into the wards, admit a new patient, and they'd say, well, don't look at this sheet from Warner's rule. So basically what they'd done is they'd ask the patient a bunch of questions and they'd filter in information, and they'd give you sort of a prioritized list of likely diagnoses. And they thought that was cheating for the medical students to look at. <laughs> My point of view is absolutely opposite. Yes, look at that first and try to figure out how they got to those numbers. You know, <laughs> interact with this technology. Don't think that somehow it's a crutch. Um, use things that are uniquely human about you, things that the machine can't do. Bring those to the interaction. But uh, that wasn't the point of view in those days. Here's a picture of Ludley near, near his first CAT scanner. It's now on display at the Smithsonian uh, Museum of Technology in Washington, D.C. He won the uh, National Award for Technology from uh, uh, Clinton. President Clinton. A funny story, you tell you a bit about the character of the man. Um, it was an evening presentation, and the photographs that were taken turned out very poorly, very grainy. The lighting was kind of bizarre. This man was not shy. He called up the White House and rescheduled the representation in the Oval Office. And Clinton, to his credit, did it. And I have a good photograph of him shaking hands in the Oval Office. <laughs> Ledley, he was a rather short man, saying it very proudly, wearing his medal, and Clinton pumping his hand. So it's a great photograph. Well, I'd like to spend again another lecture to talking about computer history per se, quite aside from biomedical computing. There's a wonderful online resources, Computer History Museum timeline at the History Museum down in Mountain View. Uh, again, I've given you a link here. You can go over it. I'm just going to point out a few salient points of importance. One is that the World, world War II had a huge impact on computing. Right? I mean, you had Turing developing the bomb. You had von Neumann getting involved in computers. Everyone wanted to build a computer then because what you had to compute, all sorts of tables for artillery pieces, uh, aircraft, navigation, all, everything in warfare required computation in modern warfare. So it's not, it shouldn't be surprising to say there were a lot of initiatives at this time. In Germany, one of the very first important all-electronic computers was being built by a, a, a man we'll talk about, Conrad Zuse, here's his name actually. He built a series of computers, Z1 through Z4. One of them apparently was built in his parents' uh, living room. <laughs> so, <laughs> again, these were early days. Um, in 1940, you had the first uh, use, remote use, use of an, a computer. George Stibitz was an important figure at Bell Labs. He was giving a talk at Dartmouth using some special telephone connections. He demonstrated using a teletype to control a computer, an electronic calculator, actually, that was in New York City. And so. Again, things we take for granted today really have long historical roots. Uh oh, we lost our. Uh, we should I stop? No. Oh, we're doing okay. Okay, great. Just the. I thought it was the blue screen of death upon us. <laughs> Fortunately, not. Just the blue screen of uh, the screensaver. Okay. Okay. You had a group at Iowa State College uh, at Tennessee and Barry working on a computer, something called Project Whirlwind, which was designed for, to be a, a flight simulator. Started at MIT. At Harvard, you had a, a, a really an amazing device, the fragments of this left at Harvard, if you ever visit there, in the uh, computing center, uh, called the Mark I. It was <laughs> based on relays, but it also had a 50-foot-long camshaft, mechanical camshaft that coordinated activities of the machine. This is probably the last electromechanical computer to be built. Um, it was succeeded very quickly after by uh, other electronic computers built at Harvard. Um, several machines were in operation at Bletchley Park where Turing was working. 
I mentioned already in 1945, John Neumann's uh, draft of this report got circulated, talking about this von Neumann machine. A little amusing sideline, Grace Hopper, who was in a, a rear admiral in the Navy, first woman of importance in computer science probably, reported the first bug. It was literally a moth that had gotten stuck between some mechanical relays. That's where the term bug comes from. And uh, Conrad Zuse by now was working on a, a new language called Plan Calculus. Very important development here. 46, John Motchley and Eckert were working on the ENIAC, which is a really important first early electronic computer. Uh, a thousand times faster than anything that existed at the time. It was a remarkable achievement. Then in 47, the first transistor tested with Bell Labs. Uh, again, you probably want to read more about the history of these people. This guy, William Shockley, was alive to, gosh, right into the 90s, I think. An amazing figure. Vitriolic, nasty, racist. I mean, it's a very controversial figure. Intellectual, great achievements. Other impacts on society may be not so pleasant. Uh, fields peopled with interesting historical figures. Worth reading. Okay, and I skip right to the future, right, right to the present month, where we finally got back the title of having the world's fastest computer. Right? The Japanese had it for quite a while. A uh, computer not far from here, Lawrence Livermore, uh, computing at 16.32 petaflops. Now, flop stands for floating operations per second, floating point operations per second. That is, how many decimal numbers can computations can you do in a second? A petaflop is 10 to the 15. That's a million, billion. Okay, <laughs> so we're 10 times that order of magnitude. Here you know, this is really pretty staggering stuff. And obviously we know what people learn little more doing they're doing research on nuclear weapons simulations, but machines like this are also useful for things like weather prediction, you know, fluid mechanics, computations that need for weather systems, simulations, things like that. What's that? Watson. Well, get into Watson, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> AI, for sure. Let's talk about uh, some concepts of the machine. I'm glad you kind of fell into that trap a little earlier but when I asked you about Unix. You, you weren't fully aware that Unix was on your, your, your iPods, nor should you be, actually. I, I should <laughs> say that, to be fair. But it's interesting to know. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit about Unix. If, if, if I have a bias in, in my talk here, if I'm a bigot in any way, it's, I'm a Unix bigot, and proudly so. And I'll, and I'll explain why as we go on. Uh, we should probably talk about the von Neumann machine. What, what is a computer? What are the basic components of it? The very basic level, and I'm sorry this diagram is so tiny, you have something called the central processing unit, which is where all the activity goes on, the addition, subtraction, which is basically most of what computers use. Well, you can do multiplications by powers of two, too. Um, some memory, where you can store programs and data. Some input-output devices. In the old days, we had things like magnetic drums, punch tape, paper tape, magnetic tape, which is also passe. Um, today, mainly disk drives and, and USB thumb drives, things like that. There's something called a control bus, and that's a communication channel that's controlling how these things interact. And an, an early problem with early designs with the von Neumann machine was something called the von Neumann bottleneck, because there was really only one bus that all these things had to share. And so the limiting speed factor not, in many cases was how fast this bus could perform. That, those days are way behind us, I'm happy to report. Uh, von Neumann bottleneck is really an historical artifact. The CPU contains something called a register. It's basically a set of bits. A bit can be on or off, representing 0 or 1. And these, these uh, bits compose something called a register. You have registers in which you're doing math, uh, mathematical computations. You can have a computer command that says, add the contents of register A to register B. You also have registers that are used for indexing, because you have this large memory that has programs in it and has data. You have to address the locations of each of those memory cells. So you have a, a, an address, a street address, think of it that way, for each location of memory. And you have a, a special register that just handles addresses. Then you have addresses that, uh, uh, registers that actually contain commands that are to be executed. Okay? And if you pull out a, a, a cell on that memory at random, you don't know what it is, it's a set of bits, right? It could be a piece of data, it could be a, a command, it could be a computer command. And this is getting down now to the really low-level hardware considerations. That instruction register is designed so that certain bit patterns cause it to do certain things, like adding numbers, subtracting numbers, shifting numbers by powers of two uh, to multiply or uh, divide. Uh, we'll talk more about what things you could do in just a moment. Uh, anyway, so, so you've got these three types of registers. The registers are built in the units of bits. 
but you also have this concept called a byte, which is currently 8 bits, but I should point out in the beginning, that was far from a definition. I mean, byte size, and you would have multiple word, bytes composing a word, byte and word sizes were all over the map. They were unique to each computer. It's only in recent years that we've, we've settled on 8 bits as being the standard size of a byte. Word sizes are still all over the map, right? You have 32-bit machines, 64-bit machines, size of the words. That generally corresponds to the sizes of the registers inside the CPU. All of this is controlled by a clock, uh, and each tick of the clock is called a cycle. And generally, you do one sort of operation per cycle, but uh, so you might do a single addition in the cycle. But that's oversimplifying things, and I'll explain more about that in a minute. Now, the speed of the machine is defined by something uh, related to a concept called Moore's Law, and uh, Charles referred to that in one of his talks when he was talking about the speed of machines trying to keep up with the speed of the increase of data in bioinformatics. Uh, He's slightly misquoted Moore's Law. Everyone, everyone does those. I'm not <laughs> faulting Charles at all. Gordon Moore was the founder of Fairchild Semiconductors, which later merged and became Intel. And in 1965, he published a paper in which he gave a rule of thumb, saying that the number of transistors on a chip is going to double approximately every two, two years now. Okay. That was later rephrased by a colleague of his named David House of Intel, in which he said the performance now performance of the chip, or something different, doubles approximately every 18, 18 months. And he was factoring not only the number of transistors you could get, but also their speed. And you could also see the efficiency of design of the chip. This era, sadly, I mean, we've been right on schedule for decades now. We're about to hit a brick wall, because we're really getting devices small enough now that we're starting to approach quantum limits, where the chips aren't going to behave the way they behaved. And what we're going to do then, it's going to be interesting to see. I mean, people have already been scrambling for at least a decade to figure out strategies. Parallel computing, multiple cores on a single chip, space on multiple computers on a single computer chip. Um, there are lots of strategies being pursued. Let's talk about the languages on these machines. We already talked a little bit about something called machine language. That's actually hardware-level uh, programming of a machine. We talked about that instruction register, zeros and ones flipped into certain positions will trigger a certain kind of activity in the machine. In the early days, on the deck, when it came out with something called the PDP-8, it was a desktop machine. It was pretty small for those days. And it had a bunch of toggle switches on the front. And you could actually flip them to actually program in a particular command into an instruction register. <laughs> and that was machine code. You're right at the level of the machine. Um, pretty tedious. You know, if you do anything serious that way, it takes you a lot of time. People started using something called assembly language, which was just one step up from that. It was a symbolic programming language. You could write it down, you know, commands. You had little acronyms for all the commands. And that got assembled into, uh, taken that is by another program called an assembler, and it would translate that into machine code for you. Now, this process of sort of stepping away from the hardware, thinking more like a human, less like a machine, that notion is a very important concept in computer science called abstraction. And you'll hear this a lot when you talk to computer scientists. Everything they do is abstraction. Okay? <laughs> when, you, when you compile a program or a symbol program, it's abstraction. When you design a new user interface to allow the user to think the way he thinks rather than the way the database thinks, that's abstraction. Um, just basically getting closer to the human, further away from the machine. That's the way I like to think of it. So languages are a form of abstraction. We talked about machine language, which is right down at the level of the silicon. Uh, we have so-called compiled languages, and we were talking earlier about you, the fact you learned BASIC, you said, and you learned, what else, Pascal? Pascal. Yeah. Well, you learned t two major, already two families of, of languages. Uh, Pascal is compiled language. That is, you write, it's a fairly high-level language, it's fairly close to, you know, you're writing down mathematics, and it's fairly human-readable. Uh, you pass that off to a computer pro program called a compiler, and that translates eventually down to the level of machine code but it's doing a lot more work and heavy lifting than an assembler would. Because you have high-level functionalities. You know, it has a notion of um, function calls for doing trigonometric, trigonometric calculations, things like that, which an assembler doesn't know about. The assembler just knows about the basic lowest-level operations. In a computer, things like multiplication, division, trigonometry, they're all built by compounding additions, subtractions, and multiplications and divisions by power of two, because that's what you can do by shifting bits right and left inside the register. Computer doesn't know how to do anything more than that. When you're doing higher level mathematics, it's always based on very complex algorithms. You can do things like doing a sine um, computation and trigonometry using these lower level operations. Does that make sense? 
Okay, so you have a whole bunch of family of compiled languages, COBOL's probably one of the oldest. Uh, Grace Hopper, we talked about earlier, that discovered the first blockchain, had a lot to do with COBOL. Fortran, still an important language, actually. It's still out there. There's a lot of people using it. It was formula translation is what it stood for. It was used a lot for scientific uh, computation. Pascal was uh, meant, I think, to be an easy language, and it was used a lot for, uh, for teaching people computer programming concepts, you know, undergraduates and the like. It's a great language. Um, it was there, there was an early division in the early history of computer languages between Fortran and so-called block-oriented languages, which Pascal would be the case. It, it was considered to be a neater, uh, more disciplined way of looking at a programming problem to look at a language like Pascal than to use Fortran, which is considered to be kind of a little bit gnarly. C would be another example of, of the block-oriented language. Pascal was an Ah, really? That's interesting. Yeah. Well, it's had its time, but it's still out there. It's kind of been supplanted by Java as the first language of choice for undergraduates now. Java, of course, is a object-oriented language. Object-oriented language is the latest sort of uh, uh, trend. Uh, all these buzzwords and fads in computer science. Like, you know, if you have any of these terms you want me to define, let me know. You also have a second family of languages, the basic, the other language you learn falls into that, interpreted languages. And that's where you, have, you pass your code to a program called an interpreter. It doesn't compile it down to machine language. It actually sort of tries to sort of figure out what you want to do and, and execute it on the fly, as it were. Okay, it's a little different. So it's like it's doing what a compiler does, but it doesn't give you, at the end of a compiler, you have an executable piece of machine code that you can run again. You don't have to use the compiler once and forget about it. This, you have to run the interpreter every time. Now, some of these also have compilers, and you can get compiled versions of this. But when it was first invented, it was basically an interpreted language. Perl, Python, JavaScript, which is a client-side language that's used a lot in web clients. Those are all basically inter examples of interpreted languages. We've already talked about abstractions, so I'll dance on from here. OK, now I get to be a little bigot for a while and, and stay get on my soapbox. Operating systems. Uh, the bane of the existence of anybody doing computer work because every machine had a unique operating system. And every, you know, as a, as a graduate student, when I was dragging around some computer simulation code I'd written. Every time I moved, I'd have to rewrite things to get it working. And it was just a huge waste of time. In the 60s, at Bell Labs, a group of computer scientists inherited a, a used PDP-11, I think. And they wrote their own operating system for it. And they had some brilliant ideas. Um, they wanted to make it platform neutral. It is something that would work on any machine. And one way they did that was to write it in a high-level computer language. Previously, compilers, or operating systems had been written in machine code by experts in that machine. This Most of Unix is written in C, which is a high-level language. That was a revolutionary concept at the time. No one had ever done that. Um, they swept in with it as philosophy of simplicity, efficiency, and parsimony. So the whole idea of it was this thing called the Unix philosophy that programmers still talk about. The idea was rather than having these huge monolithic applications that try to do everything, you have a whole bunch of little tiny tools. The metaphor would be that uh, in the old days, you got handed a Tonka truck, the equivalent of a Tonka truck. It was a fire truck, say. It was a lovely fire truck. That's all it was ever going to be. Unix handed you a bag of Lego bricks. A whole bunch of little tools. You could build your own fire truck. It wasn't as elegant looking as the Tonka truck, you know. It didn't have a metal paint job on it, that sort of thing. But it would do the job. And when you were tired of the fire truck, you took a piece of it and you built the Apple Tower model or, or you know, whatever you wanted. The way Unix is. It was a whole bunch of little tools and it had a scripting language that you can interact with. And you could put these tools together to make it do very interesting and powerful things. It still has an important impact on computing today. I mean, it's Unix and its kin are the single most important operating system. You can say that hands down. Running Linux, you probably know of. That's a free sort of clone of, of, of Unix. What flavor of Unix? Unix had several flavors in the early days. What flavor is running on the iPhone? You guys know? Berkeley Unix. I told you we'd mention Berkeley again. Uh, Berkeley had a tie in with AT&T at Bell Labs. A couple of the AT&T folks came out here, took a sabbatical, worked at Berkeley. Berkeley became one of the major centers for the development of Unix. Berkeley and AT&T. And in fact, they kind of bifurcated. There were two flavors of Unix for a long time AT&T and Berkeley. There still are. But they more or less kind of pulled back together in most respects. But um, I saw the soft spot for Berkeley Linux, frankly. Um, OK, machine performance. We talked a bit about Moore's Law earlier. A lot of people talk about clock rate on chips and think that's, that tells you everything you need to know about 
performance or speed of the computer. Not true. It's certainly true. I mean, if, you, if you're staying in the same product line, same processor family, same operating system, and you go from 2 gigahertz processor to 3 gigahertz processor, yes, it's going to be faster. Uh, but there are a lot of things that come into play here. Uh, it's, it also depends on the, the, not only the chip speed, but also its design. There was a major revolutionary change about 20 years ago when we moved from something called a CIS chip to a RISC chip. You heard these terms, RISC chips? CIS, C-I-S-C, Complete Instruction Set Computer. R-I-S-C, Reduced Instruction Set Computer. Well, people who devised chips got very proud and very confident, and they started building all sorts of high-level functions into the silicon. So, you know, high-level mathematical calculations. You no longer had to simulate them with these complex algorithm, algorithms I talked about. It was not on the chip for you, which is lovely for programmers. Um, at a certain point, people realize, wait a minute, we're paying a really heavy penalty for this because the chips are getting incredibly complex. A lot of transistors being used for a lot of heat. If we just simplify the chip design and go back to the old days of doing it in software, things will actually be faster again. So we can make those reduced instruction set chips so much faster, we more than compensate for the time taking in the software overhead. So virtually everyone today is using reduced instruction set chips in their computers. Certainly this machine is. Sort of back to the future. Um, something else we need to probably talk about is the base of numbers. We all we use base 10, right, in our society. Um, so when we write out a number, for example, 60 here, the, the first place is for ones, the second place is for tens, right? If we went out the third place, it would be for hundreds. So we're going out in powers of 10. Well, you know, cultures have used all sorts of different bases for the counting systems. We're talking about the Babylonians and their abacus. They used base 60, which meant you had to have 60 representations of a numeral <laughs> to do anything with that. I, I couldn't keep that in my head, I know. The, the Mayan abacus, which I think was fabric-based, use base 20. Uh, computer science, what you're going to see is hexadecimal, which is a power of 2, which is why you see it. Decimal, which is what we use commonly. Octal, which is another power of 2. And binary, which is what the machine is using. Again, another power of 2. Um, there are lots of ways of encoding text as well. Um, many have been invented. You know, there's an older one called Ebsidic you'll never hear about anymore. The one that's more or less universal now is ASCII. But even ASCII is soon to disappear. Very soon, I hope. It's been, it, it, ASCII is 8-bit, which means you can only represent as many characters as you have numbers in 8-bits, which is 256. Works fine for Latin alphabet. And special symbols, a few special symbols, and after that, you're kind of cooked. It's been replaced by Unicode, which has been good for at least 20 years now. That uses between 8 and 32-bits. It, it currently represents something like 110,000 characters. 100 scripts, which is what Unicode people call out, what we would call alphabets. This represents virtually every known living and dead human language. It's absolutely an amazing piece of work. Very cleverly designed, designed in such a way that ASCII is actually Unicode. Unicode systems will recognize ASCII as valid Unicode. It's very clever the way they did this. You can read more about the algorithm on your own if you're interested. Just give you a little quick example here that gives us both a letter, uh, an example of these different bases and of uh, character encodings. In ASCII, the letter A, capital A, is represented as 65 decimal, which is 41 hexadecimal. Let's do a little math here. Hexadecimal means it's base 16. So the, for, this is the ones place and this is the 16's place, right? 4 times 16 is 64 plus 1 is 65. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not cheating here. Octal, this is base 8. So this is the 1's place, the 8's place, and the 64's place, right? We have 164 plus 1, 65. And then this is finally the binary representation of 65. Again, we have 1, and this would be the 2's place, the 4's place. We go up in powers of 2, to we go up in power of 2 to the uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, to the 6th, which is 64, plus 1, 65. Okay, so we've given you a little example there of different bases, the arithmetic basis representation. Internet. Okay, we're, see, we're coming up on 10 to 9, so I'm really going to hope it here. <laughs> There's a great online timeline you can get to called the Hobbes Internet Timeline. I'm going to go at it by decades here. Basically, in the 50s, we saw a lot of early, we saw the foundation, actually, of ARPA in response to the, to the satellite scare, Sputnik launch. Uh, and in the early 60s, you saw a lot of early papers on, the, on networking and packet switching. Packet switching is the underlying technology of the, the network, and we'll talk about what it is in just a second. 
uh, in the late 60s, ARPA kicked off the creation of something called the ARPANET. Um, the first four nodes of which were, two of which were in California, UCLA and UC Santa Barbara. So it's just kind of an important history in this state, in the early history of the web, or the, the net. The first so-called request for comments, RFCs are basically sort of quasi-standards in the internet community. You'll hear this term a lot if you hang around with internet geeks. RFCs. There are a few number of things called internet standards, very small in number. Most, most working standards are generated in this form, RFCs, request for comments. In the early days, something like three-quarters of the traffic on the, on the network was email. <laughs> there, but there also, there were early examples of voice and text chat, so it was used for communication from the get-go. Okay. In the 70s was the introduction of actually the notion of an internet, because the first thing I talked about, those four nodes, was actually a, a little network. It really wasn't an internet. The idea of an internet was a network of networks. That was the whole idea of internet, internetworking. Um, the, the real idea for that was laid out in the 70s by two guys, named Robert Kahn and Ben Cerf. Ben Cerf is still considered sort of the, the godfather of the net and a highly revered figure. He was at this Turing Centennial, by the way. He's a Turing Award winner and uh, was played a big role in it. Very delightful man, very benign, wonderful human being. Um, the two primary underlying protocols are TCP and IP, Transmission Control Protocol and Internet Protocol. And we'll talk about what those do in a minute when I talk about what a network is. Bolt, Moranek, and Newman, a Boston consulting firm, played a major role in the early days of the network, a lot of the work. In the 80s, Unix desktop workstations appeared. One of the big players in this area was Sun, a company that's since been bought out by Oracle. But the Sun had a huge impact on the early history of the web. It was the first sort of widely available scientific affordable computer that was networking was built in. You could use Berkeley Unix. And Berkeley Unix had a very tightly coupled relationship with the network. It sort of grew up together. And it was an operating system for which networking was kind of an intrinsic part of it. It didn't feel bolted on the side like the PC did in the early days and the other machines. Something called DNS appeared in, this, in the early 80s. That was something that allowed you to take, you know, all the machines in the network have numerical addresses. And DNS allowed you to assign a symbolic address to a machine and translate it automatically into that numerical address, which was kind of used behind the curtain. And various parts of Internet governance appeared at this point. Good luck, Cyril. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm going to skip over some of the governance. We'll talk about that in a moment separately. Um, where are we today, though? We're at the point now where Google's crawler on the network has reached one trillion pages of documents. And not all indexed now, okay, <laughs> but it's reached out to that many. We have a new version of IP, version 6, which is meant to address the problem of address space congestion. We'll talk about that in just a second. Let's talk about the characteristics of the network. Packet switching as opposed to cell and networks. Telephony in the early days, it was circuit switched. You actually had an electric circuit between part A and part B. If you go around with a cell phone today, you're moving around between different zones that are controlled by a cell tower, right? So you're, as you move between those zones, you're switched into these different uh, cell areas, but you're still on the network through these cells. That's called cell switching. Packet switching is a completely different notion. Again, invented in the 50s, elaborated in the 60s. Uh, the idea is you have a body of information you chop up in discrete little chunks and then put them inside a little uh, the equivalent of an electronic envelope and address information and some identifying information. Those are packets. You send them out over a network and they can all travel by different routes and they get reassembled with the receiving end. The big revolutionary notion behind this was robustness and failure. The idea behind the network was that you could lose connections and, and you you just find another way of getting the data to, to where it needed to go. IP, the Internet Protocol, was concerned with just one thing. That was getting routing. That is, getting packets from point A to point B, figuring out the best route to follow. TCP, Transmission Control Protocol, was concerned with the equally important problem of getting the data there intact. So if a packet didn't show up or was out of sequence, TCP would handle that. Okay, would ask for a resend, for example, if a packet somehow got lost because the connection was dropped somewhere along the line. The, um, I'm going to skip over some of the programming aspects of this. IP version 4 was what we've been using to date, but IPv6 has been rolling out gradually over the last 10 years or so. The huge improvement with that is it has a much larger address space. We've run out of, or we're soon to run out of addresses with IPv4. When they invented it, they had no idea the Internet would be the best success it's become. Also, uh, well, I did talk a bit about, let's talk a bit about governments. There's this thing called the Internet Society. You have this board of gray beards under that called the Internet Architecture Board, the IAB. Under that, you have the Internet Research Task 
course, which is, again, really high-level distinguished engineers. And under that, you have the Hoi Polloi, the Internet Engineering Task Force. I participate in that. Anybody can. If you have the money for a plane ticket, you can go and you're in. But it's a very aggressive group. These are very sharp people, and it's sort of a full of the peer review process live. I mean, it's, if you don't know what you're talking about, you'll get shouted down and pretty quickly. But uh, that's basically what's running the technical back end of the web. World Wide Web is an ex exemplar, invented by Tim Berners-Lee at CERN, uh, later picked up by NCSA, uh, part of Urbana-Champaign, and then one of those figures came out and founded Netscape. Uh, you know a bit about Netscape? There is Netscape, yeah, again, no longer with us. It's now guided by the World Wide Web Consortium and the ITF, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, there were competitors in the early days. A system called Gopher, another system called Waze. Their history, their toast. Very disruptive technology. I like to call it a multi-multi system because it's multi-protocol. It, it, it pulled together a whole bunch of separate communications protocol on the net. You can do mail through it. You can do FTP file transfer. You can do telnet logins to other computers. You can do World Wide Web itself. Uh, all in one interface. It was multi-platform. It runs on all different machines. And it was multimedia. That's something, by the way, that Tim wasn't that keen on there. He was really keen in terms of text. This was for sharing physics preprints. He was at CERN in Geneva. Uh, these were the extensions were added by other people. But there are three important lessons to draw away from that. One, why was it such a success? One, it was free. <laughs> and the original NCSA server, which evolved into Apache, is still the world's most popular, far and away, the world's single most popular uh, web server, and one of the most single most popular pieces of software, period. It was simple. It just had two underlying protocols. Hypertext markup language was a simple way of marking up text documents. And markup is very different from something like Word. It's not concerned with how you're going to make it look. It's concerned with the logical content of the document. So this is a bibliographic reference. This is the title of the bibliographic reference. This is the author. This is the date. It marks up. It basically tells you what the content is. It makes machining uh, written text a piece of cake. Whereas if you start with a Word document, well, you know, it's in this font, this size, in this location of the document. Maybe it's the title. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's an author name. Maybe it's a journal title. You don't know. You know, doing that's a big job. Uh, markup language, the whole notion is important. And, and Tim was a brilliant engineer, not because he invented anything, but because he invented as little as he could get away with to get the job done. He grabbed something that was already out there, systematic generalized markup language, and dumbed it down to HTML. There, he used other transport protocols as examples to develop HTTP. It does the job, but it does it very simply. How are we doing in time? Um, uh, too much time left, do we? Yeah, yeah. Right, right away? Uh, okay. Yeah, it's kind of wrap up. okay, let me wrap up now. There's so much more I would have liked to talk to you about, but we'll leave these notes available in the department server somehow. Um, yeah, if you send it to me, I'll put it in. Okay, time. thank you very much for doing that. I didn't have time to talk about the dark side. There are lots of downside risks, security, we all know about that. Permanence of data. Wish I had time to talk about that. A long example of an archival gold CD. Uh, the storage meeting up today, are they going to be around? Like, you know, we have books and parchments that have been with us for 3,000 years. Is anything we're creating today going to be around with us that long? It's a big unresolved question. Safety, I would have loved to talk to you more about that. There's some really historically important examples of disasters in medical computing. The therapy, radiation therapy disaster, probably the single most important case study. It's three deaths from radiation poisoning in radiation therapy due to software failures. Terrible story. Um, future directions. Again, that's what I would have liked to spend the whole hour talking about. <laughs> there are going to be important developments and exciting developments in all these areas. AI, machine learning, pattern recognition, uh, watch out pathologists. <laughs> Decision support, natural language processing. We're going to be interacting with computers in a much more natural way. Multimodal interfaces, some tremendously cool stuff. These zoom in user interfaces, I would have loved to demonstrate this to you another time. Uh, gestural uh, interfaces, you've seen that. You've seen that Tom Cruise movie, uh, uh, Minority Report. You've seen an example of that. Those are out there now. Language, natural language spoken interfaces. These zooming interfaces are wonderful. It would be a wonderful way to represent, for example, a patient history. Uh, basically a timeline where you can zoom in on specific details and pull up lab resorts. You can really imagine that in a clinical setting. Crowdsourcing. We're already tracking epidemics by tracking what people are saying in chat rooms, that sort of thing. Uh, one group has proposed maps of automatic electronic defibrillators by people just inputting where they find them and creating a global map so people know how to find these things. It's a great idea. 
fold it, uh, turning protein folding problem into a game. There are people out there that have solved protein folding problems, crowdsourcing. Robotics, huge improvements on the way. Watch out for Willow Garage down in the valley, doing really interesting work. Telepresence, uh, mobile computing, prosthetics. One of the board members of Computers and Biology and Medicine is working on wonderful prosthetic legs that are controlled by your brain, by chips that are implanted. Uh, the Holy Grail, well, that's room for a whole lecture series. The electronic medical record, we're still not there. I, I can say with some confidence the personal health record, a little subset of that so far, resounding failure. And we can list all the people who have started the effort and closed it down, including NLM, Google, Microsoft, Cerner. Okay, I think that's it. It's called a wrap. Thank you. Sorry we didn't have more time. Thanks. Feel free, anyone listening to this later, to get a hold of me by email if you have questions or comments. And we can talk about more of this stuff later if you like. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. So much. It's been Thanks. my pleasure. Bye now. See you later, John.